So I'm going to go through all the things that they do and be hungry. Both you and the dog, they need to exercise more. And Let's then go on to the topic of behavior and um, <coughs> we'll use these, uh, these, the discussion so far as a platform uh, to consider some things about behavior. To ask the rhetorical question, why is this pet fat? <coughs> In the wild, there is, for example, uh, no colic in horses. There's no bloat in cattle. There's no urolithiasis in tomcats that are neutered. There's no hip dysplasia in the coyote or the wolf. And it, it, even in fish, the, the aquarium is subject to periodic wipeout due to infections, bacteria. This never happens in the wild. And you must ask yourself, what's the difference here? Captivity alters behavior. Even in people. If you go back to the beginning of the agricultural revolution, which is about the beginning of civilization 10,000 years ago, and you can look at human remains prior to that time, these bones are all healthy. If you look at them since then, there's a lot of problems. There was a guy by the name of Dr. Wilson Price in the 1930s. He went around the world and he found 11 populations that existed in two uh, divisions of one genetic pool. There was uh, the people that existed in the primordial hunter-gatherer uh, mode that they'd known for eons, and then there was a group of the same people that were westernized, modern. And he found that without exception in all 11 populations that gum disease was rampant in the westernized populations and bone, uh, bone disease. It's, it was vogue for a while for the archaeologists to talk about the Pima Indians outside of Arizona. <clears throat> Said they had a thrifty gene. They all had diabetes, a very high rate of diabetes. Everybody thought the Pima Indians were unique. They're not. <clears throat> you see the very same problem in the Aborigines of Australia, in the Nehru of Micronesia, and in po Polynesians in general. And <clears throat> uh, Don't look now, but the tribe they call Americans has the same thing. There are 17 million diabetics in this country. And that's just, you know, diabetes. Look at all the ones with pre-diabetes, the very thing they talk about in the Pimas. So again, our behavior is not right either when it comes to nutrition. What does hunter-gathering foraging do? Several things. Of course, first of all, it burns calories. Secondly, you're eating small, frequent meals. And you're exercising. And that is the behavior that our genome is set up to support. Same with our pets. <clears throat> People want a correct diet, but they're ignorant. And I use that in the very kind sense of the word, meaning they don't know. Let's consider, for example, the elephants in the Minneapolis Zoo. Now, <clears throat> their bet elephants in the wild eat browse, trees, bushes all kinds of stuff. Well, if you turn these elephants loose in Minneapolis, the entire, every tree in City Park would be gone in the summer. And of course, there'd be nothing in the winter. So they feed the elephants hay. The elephants don't die, but they don't live 50 years like they do in the wild. Now, <clears throat> be, behavior can be very subtle. Your pet can tell by the force and cadence of your footstep if you're going to the bathroom, if you're going to work, or if you're going to feed them. To them, it's the same as a billboard. It's a PA system. And we have no idea about this. Your pets can tell if it's you coming home or if it's the UPS truck. And I've often thought, if you wanted to really confuse them, come home in a UPS truck. Uh, you probably all recall the story of Seabiscuit, the very famous racehorse. Uh, he didn't become famous until the owners, the new owners realized that Seabiscuit was doing exactly what he'd been trained to do. They trained him to pace 
their favorite horses that were in training for winning. And Seabiscuit was not allowed to win. He could only come in second. And these new owners, they were disgusted with their purchase. All it did was come in second. And then they realized what had gone on, they fixed that. <clears throat> I remember one time I have a horse that I was trying to come, train to come to a whistle. And this horse is not motivated by pleasing me in the least. And this was a difficult task. And we tried every day with the grain and you know, follow me. <clears throat> one day he and the other horses were out in the pasture and I did this whistle, a whippoorwill. He didn't bother, but there's another horse that had been in the stall next to him that came running instantly. He'd gotten it from the beginning, and I never even tried on him. So uh, you have to be willing to go back and carefully analyze your behavior uh, because it's, it's as big a part. They're being honest. We're the ones that are deluding ourselves. <clears throat> of course, uh, <clears throat> the pets are training us all the time. And I'll set this up this way. <clears throat> of course, everybody knows about the, 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 the image, the concept of the fireman <clears throat> getting the hook and ladder truck and getting the kitten out of the tree. <clears throat> well, I one time had a fireman observe to me, this kind old veteran, he said, you know, I have never seen a cat skeleton in a tree. <clears throat> the you know, the kitty's up there mewing, and of course the little girl's all upset, and we call the fire company, and we get the kitten down. The kitten would get itself down if you left it alone. And I guess this is perhaps the key point here. You must resolve to outlast your pet. They know full well. I mean, I can just hear them talking. Wait, wait, don't eat that. What do you mean, don't eat that? I'm telling you, don't eat that. But I'm hungry. I like it. I want to eat it. No, trust me. We'll let it go half an hour and she'll go to the grocery store and get us something better. I um, then call your attention to Rojo, the Doberman, that went for six months with near nothing. And we can't wait half an hour. They've got us trained. Oh my God, <clears throat> they didn't eat it. There's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with the dog. You got to learn to outlast them. How do we do this? I one time designed a diet for some primates, uh, chimpanzees in a zoo. There was fruit and vegetables, you know, a, a good diet, and there was a balanced, what we called a uh, monkey, ch monkey chow, biscuit. <coughs> Excuse me. And the keepers presented <coughs> all this food. <coughs> and it was comical to watch. This chimp would pick up an apple and then it'd pick up an orange, and then its foot would pick up a grapefruit, and the other foot would pick up another banana, and they'd go off in the corner and eat all this. They were full, they didn't want any more. They threw the biscuits at the keeper, along with their turds. Well, the keepers weren't dumb. They weren't gonna waste the city budget, and they weren't gonna put up with this monkey business. So when I reappeared, they told me they'd stop feeding the biscuit. It took the monkeys two days to train the keepers to not feed the biscuit. And again, this is, this is, captivity has set up this behavior. The way you do it is you give the biscuit and the biscuit only. And if they don't eat it, you take it away. And tomorrow you give the biscuit and the biscuit only. I guarantee you, they will eat anything in time. As soon as they eat the biscuits, they get fruit as a reward, <clears throat> positive reinforcement. And we'll go into all that cycle babble in just a second. <clears throat> so my point is, if these pets are gonna be in our care, it's our obligation to train them. And we must do it from an informed point of view. <clears throat> 